I have fond memories of meeting Dr. Joseph Caprini in person. The Department of Surgery at Boston Medical Center had just joined NISQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. A couple of consecutive reports in 2009 revealed that we had an incredibly high observed to expected ratio of 3.41 for postoperative venous thromboembolism, or VTE. And that means that our patients were nearly three and a half times more likely than expected to develop a postoperative deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. In fact, we had the ignominious claim to the most rightward column on the historic caterpillar hump bar graft at that time. We thought we were following correct practices for VT prophylaxis, but I knew that we had to improve something. Therefore, I stalked Dr. Caprini at the 2010 Clinical Congress of the American College of Surgeons in Washington, D.C. Dr. Caprini spoke to a packed house, and I waited in a crowd at the foot of the podium when his lecture ended. He will not recall our original meeting, although it had a major impact on my professional career and on our patients at Boston Medical Center. His convincing advocacy for individualized VTE risk assessment and risk commensurate VTE prophylaxis made complete sense to me, and I desperately had to meet him. Well, if you know Dr. Caprini, you know that he was in great demand after that lecture, and he was naturally rushed for time. In fact, I had to chase him from the Walter E. Washington Convention Center as he raced to the Mount Vernon Square Metro Station to catch his flight home to Chicago from Reagan National Airport. I even had to purchase a Metro ticket to complete our conversation in the subway station before he left town. Nevertheless, Dr. Caprini graciously listened to my ideas about adopting his Caprini risk assess assessment model to our electronic medical record. We subsequently accomplished that first in the Sunrise Clinical Manager EMR and then in EPIC. The implementation of the Caprini protocol resulted in a prompt decline in the risk adjusted ratio for VTE complications from the 10th, that's the highest decile, to eventually the first or most favorable decile. And that includes a recent odds ratio of 0.73. This program mandates VTE risk stratification on every patient undergoing an operation at Boston Medical Center, initially on the general surgery and vascular surgery services, and it promotes a structured institution of extended courses of VTE prophylaxis beyond hospital stays for patients at the greatest risk of developing a VTE. In fact, our odds ratio has been 1.0 or lower since academic year 2012, and we have not looked back. Dr. Caprini has graciously referred to our Boston experience as the benchmark for the nation along with our successful ICOF program to prevent postoperative pulmonary complications, the Caprini success has driven the odds ratio of any postoperative complication at BMC from the 10th, or the most opportunity decile, to the first or second decile. Not only have we disseminated this formal VTE risk assessment and risk-based prophylaxis model among nearly all surgery specialties at our institution, but we have also created a scholarly enterprise that has engaged several surgery research fellows. Our manuscripts and presentations report the sustained success of the Caprini protocol in general and vascular surgery, and we have reported on the validity of the Caprini risk assessment model in head and neck operations, esophagectomies, and lung cancer operations. We reported the first prospective application of this program in thoracic surgery as well. In addition, we analyze patients who develop VTE events despite the Caprini protocol and demonstrated that the presence of emergency operations, multiple operations, and perioperative sepsis accounted for these so-called failures that occurred even when patients were prescribed seemingly appropriate VTE prophylaxis. We later co corroborated the significance of these factors with an analysis of nearly 1.6 million patients in the NISQIP database. As a result, we then designed a pro, uh, protocol of enhanced prophylaxis for patients with combinations of these hazards. 
We also investigated the role of the Caprini model in breast surgery, thyroid and parathyroid operations, and sleeve gastrectomies, with an emphasis on using the Caprini protocol to identify both high-risk patients who require extended courses of VTE prophylaxis, as well as those patients who do not require anticoagulation prophylaxis following operations that may pose a higher likelihood or consequence of bleeding. Our group is now exploring the development of a more comprehensive risk assessment model while also making it more facile, including the possibility of using natural language processing to detect certain risk factors in the EMR. Nevertheless, there is no substitute for personally asking each preoperative patient explicit questions about whether they have a personal or family history of a VTE. These two risk factors carry substantial weight in predicting the development of a postoperative VTE. Twelve years later, I am grateful and honored to call Dr. Caprini my friend and mentor. The many emails, phone calls, personal meetings, and Zoom calls with Dr. Caprini have been highlights of my career. His knowledge of VTE risk assessment and prevention is encyclopedic, and his lectures remain moments of proverbially drinking from the fire hose. I hope you buckle up while viewing his multimedia empire. Thank you for listening to our story, and thank you, Dr. Caprini. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, present to you today a very, very important topic from the uh, Boston University, which I consider uh, having the uh, representing the poster child for venous thromboembolism in the United States, because as a matter of fact, uh, they have published 16 papers on this uh, on this problem. And what they've done was very interesting. They had a higher incidence of venous thromboembolism than the national average. And so they instituted a policy where they did a Caprini score risk assessment, mandated its use according to an algorithm based on evidence. And that required giving anticoagulant prophylaxis for either a week or a month, depending on the score. And, and by the way, uh, the evidence for a week of prophylaxis is the period of efficacy that's been demonstrated in the literature in 146 centers over the past 30 years. And the, 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 uh, the program was very successful. And you might say, well, yes, that was a great program. But I know when I tried to do some of those programs at my own university, and then I backed off, the rates went back up. Well, guess what, folks? Boston University has maintained these rates of lower than a percent of venous thromboembolism on the surgical service for over a decade. And they've had very good buy-in. And I'm very honored today to have Spencer Wilson with us, who's a resident in general surgery. And Spencer's a graduate of the Davidson College where he measured, ma majored in all things economics. But then he received a master's degree in global health from King's College in London and an MD degree from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Very unique individual. And you see, this is what the modern approach has got to be in medicine, not just having people studying medicine, but economics and, and, and all sorts of other uh, uh, related disciplines, including cost effectiveness and, and uh, group psychology and all sorts of things. And uh, Dr. Wilson uh, has a special penchant in uh, uh, research focused on reducing the incidence of post-operative complications and with a goal of establishing comprehensive standards for the care of all patients undergoing major operations. And another thing that I think that he's very uh, adamant about and has certainly taught me a lot about too is improving patient awareness. And he just gave a beautiful lecture today on, on patient awareness uh, for venous thromboembolism, and it's bad, and it needs to be improved. So um, with that in mind, I would like to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Spencer Wilson and uh, welcome you to uh, today's program. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Caprini, and it really is a privilege to be back here uh, with the Venus Resource Center to talk about some of the work that we've been doing at Boston Medical Center. So I've titled my talk today, The Boston Experience, Part Two. And I thought I'd begin with a recap of some of the uh, part one that we went through in our last video. 
Uh, so just to remind everyone, we implemented our Caprini risk score at BMC back in 2010. It was integrated into the electronic medical record to make it easy for clinicians to use. And it was also linked to a mandatory order set to make it easy for doctors to prescribe evidence-based venous thromboembolism prophylaxis to patients that were at high risk of a VTE. And what did we find? There was a massive and sustained reduction in our rates of postoperative VTE beginning in 2010. And that reduction, as Dr. Caprini mentioned, was sustained over time, over the past decade. But our group wasn't satisfied with that reduction, even though we were ahead of other uh, national surgical hospitals. We felt like we could do better. And so we wanted to focus on the patients that were still having venous thromboembolic events during this period. There was a group led by Dr. Michael Cassidy, who's still a surgeon at Boston Medical Center, and Dr. David McEnany, that looked at patterns of failure of our protocol in preventing VTE. And specifically, they wanted to learn about patients that had developed a VTE despite being on our protocol. And Dr. Cassidy analyzed over 9,000 operations over four years. And during that period, there were just 27 postoperative VTE events for an incidence of less than 0.3%. Less than so we were doing a good job at preventing VTE, but we felt like we could be doing better. And the questions that they wanted to answer were, that, were these. Number one, was our protocol missing at-risk patients? And number two, had the Caprini risk score failed at identifying patients at risk of VTE? To answer those questions, they took a closer look at those patients that had developed a VTE. What they found was that Caprini risk scores in those patients ranged from four, indicating moderate risk, to 10, highest risk. In other words, the Caprini risk score was doing an excellent job at identifying patients at risk of VTE. All of those patients were correctly prescribed postoperative chemo prophylaxis. And only four patients had missed one or more doses of prophylaxis. So that brought, up, brought us to a question, several questions in fact. So just to answer those that I brought up before, was our protocol missing patients? No. Had the Caprini risk score failed? Absolutely not. The Caprini risk score was working beautifully at identifying high-risk patients. And had we applied the protocol correctly or incorrectly? And the answer is not in the majority of cases. What they found was when they looked at protocol application, there were just 22% of these VTE patients that had had some lapse or another from the protocol. So in the vast majority of cases, we had applied the protocol correctly. So that brought us to the question, why is it that these patients still developed VTEs? And to answer that question, Dr. Cassidy and his colleagues wanted to look at what made these VTE patients different from patients that didn't develop VTEs. And they found that there were three different key risk factors. Number one, emergency operations. So 63% of patients that developed VTE had had an emergency operation during their hospital course versus 13% for those that didn't develop VTE. Next, multiple operations. So 52% of patients that had a VTE had had multiple operations versus just 2% for those that didn't have a VTE. And finally, perioperative sepsis or infections. So 52% of patients with a VTE had had preexisting or postoperative infections. But you could say, okay, Spencer, you found that that was true at your hospital with your protocol, but how do we know that that's true at other hospitals around the country and around the world? So Dr. Uh, Stephanie Vaughn, who at the time was a student at the Boston University School of Medicine, decided to review over 1.6 million surgical patients in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program database to see if these key risk factors still stood out. And what she found was that each of these uh, risk factors were still significant predictors of VTE in this large national data set. The risk was even higher for patients when they had two or three of those risk factors combined. 
So to really understand why patients develop VTE despite being on prophylaxis, we have to change our understanding of VTE development and prophylaxis. And I wanna reference the work of Kirill Lobostov and his colleagues. Uh, and Dr. Lobostov really wanted to look at the emerging field of thrombodynamics, which is all about understanding how thrombosis develops in the body and how patients respond to anticoagulants. And he also looked at patients that developed breakthrough VTE. And what he found was that extremely high risk patients don't respond to prophylaxis in the same way. Prophylaxis just doesn't work as well in them. And so our approach to prophylaxis needs to account for these individualized differences. Here at Boston Medical Center, we've been working to change our practice to account for these new findings. We now have a protocol that involves enhanced Caprini prophylaxis. So for patients that are at high risk of a breakthrough VTE, we provide twice daily low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis with a drug called enoxaparin. We also monitor the drug's efficacy with anti-10A levels and then make dose adjustments based on an algorithm. Which patients are eligible for advanced Caprini? So any patient with two of the three risk factors that I brought up earlier, emergency operations, multiple operations, and perioperative sepsis. So what is the take home message here? Number one, the Caprini risk score works for identifying patients at a high risk of VTE. And at our hospital, it continues to work beautifully. Number two, not all patients respond to VTE prophylaxis in the same way. And our approach to treating those patients and preventing VTE needs to account for those differences. And number three, patients with emergency operations, multiple operations, and perioperative sepsis are at high risk of breakthrough VTE. And finally, new advancements in prophylaxis and pharmaceutical monitoring may help to prevent breakthrough VTE. Thank you very much, Spencer, and thank you, Dr. McEnany. And I'm uh, hoping to uh, uh, have Boston back uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the limelight again in the future as you get more results from an ongoing uh, program uh, that is designed to uh, prevent uh, breakthrough thrombosis. And I'd like to thank everybody for watching and stay tuned for uh, our next video.